a lot of people in the spiritual world now is starting to talk about creating your reality, right? Drives me nuts, but never mind. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing in the correct application. I mean, in, and I think that's where it fails in many cases because you are creating your reality. But if for one second you forget that the rest of the universe is creating its own reality as well, and that it's a feedback between the outside and the inside, then you got a problem. Okay? I used to say, you know, I, I used to say Sedona is the worst place to have a car accident because you know you'll be, you know, dying on the street in blood, and people will come by and say, "Why did you create that in your life?" And it's like. Yeah, you know, it's a good way to not have empathy, right? <laughs> but so I'm saying, you know, it's a feedback, it's a relationship. It, it, it's not a one way thing, it's a two way thing. So it's like we, we interpret the field, and the field gives us something, but when in physics, there's a really good analogy for this because I added torque and correlative forces to Einstein field equation to solve for unified field theory. But when, when you do that, currently in the fundamental concepts of geometry in uh, in Euclid in uh, in typical Minkowski space in, in Einstein field equation, the triads like the the three vectors of space, right, and the one vector at a time. Um, let, let's say you rotate it around a geodesic uh, on the surface of a black hole, for instance. It should come back the same, but but if you add torque and correlative effect, if the black hole has hair, then it comes back change. Okay, and that's what I believe is going on: is that the universe learns about itself by sending information in, and then you seeing the result outside, and then and then interpreting that and then sending that back in and, and that's what a fractal is. From a deterministic, small, simple equation, you reiterate it and reiterate it and you get something completely nonlinear. Incredible amount of complexity from a very simple, simple beginning. And and the, I believe that's how the universe learn and I believe that's how you learn by your experiences. And so how you interpret it truly is going to influence how it's going to come back to you. But it's going to come back a little bit change. Because if it wasn't, then the universe would stop. Right there, it would be done. It would learn everything. You'd get bored so fast, right? If you could create your reality and it came out exactly the way you wanted it, you'd, like within seconds, you'd like, whoa. And then you'd be, what do I do now? Right? So that would be the end of the universe. But if it continuously changes, so you, you want a red Camaro, you get a blue one. Dang. All right. Well, now you're starting to kind of have a feel for blue. Uh, next thing you know, you get in a car accident and you have to repaint it. Now it's purple. Dang. So now you got to get a feel for purple. And so on and so on and so on. And so, uh, so. That's like if you start to see your relationship to the universe in that feedback and, and you know, I don't have time tonight, but I can show you the equations that prove that that's how the universe function. I mean, why? I mean, it's not just a philosophical thing, is it? This is why the sun is radiating. <laughs> this is why the galaxy is there. This is why the universe is there. That feedback in a toroidal dynamic that creates uh, our reality and the, re the relationship between the two. So I started to realize as well that um, that there must be, you know, like let's go back in time again. And now I'm uh, I'm a teenager. Uh, I got kicked out of many other schools, <laughs> and. Um, I'm uh, starting my classes in science, and uh, I think it was chemistry. I was in the first class of science was chemistry, and hydrogen and mathematics. And uh, I got really excited. The first thing I, you know, I put my hand up. I said, 
um, can you tell me what an atom is? So I was, I thought, oh, he's going to have some kind of, you know, good explanation for what the heck is an atom because I couldn't figure it out. And um, I, I was really surprised from the answer. First, the answer was, well, that would be a physics question. And uh, second, uh, this is really not part of our curriculum for this, uh, you know. And, um, and anyway, in general, we don't know what an atom exactly is. But he said, there's something we know, and that is, is that atoms are made of at least 99.9999999% space. And I was mind blown by that answer. I was like, oh my God, you know, it's mostly space. <laughs> and because it doesn't feel that way, I mean, you know, it just feels pretty solid. When you hit your head against a wall, you know, it hurts, uh, all this stuff. So it's like, that's mostly space. And, and so I started to think about it. And that's when I realized that the vacuum structure must have something to do with it. If I asked you today, what, let's assume that there's something that connects all things that makes sure that all things communicate with each other so that we can have this level of complexity today. What would be that thing? How would you, if I asked you to point out it, what connects all things, the only thing you could come up with if you thought about it for a while, could take you a few years or a few minutes, would be the vacuum, right? There's vacuum at all levels. There's vacuum is everywhere. Uh -huh. The space is everywhere. And so, you know, for me to realize that there's 99.999% vacuum everywhere, and especially in atoms, started to realize that the vacuum might have something to do with this. And I realized that maybe atoms are just like little divisions of the vacuum. Maybe the vacuum is what's really there, <laughs> and the divisions of the vacuum appears to us as reality. It's, uh, it's a difficult thing when you work in the context of mainstream physics, science, and so on. You can't really alter words too much, because if you do, then they don't know what you're talking about. And, and uh, so like the tendency, for instance, in the public is to think of the vacuum as something that's empty and really actually, even in the physics world, you know, like top physicists that I talked to about that and, and, uh, and you, you talk about the vacuum and they're visualizing either a chamber that's being evacuated, right, on Earth, or, you know, a place with nothing in, you know. The thing is, is that there's no such thing. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, no, there's really not an absolute vacuum anywhere. Um, even intergalactic space, which is the largest vacuum we know, and millions and millions of times more vacuum than anything we can produce in a chamber on Earth. And even in that case, the molecules are only centimeters apart. See, so that's how dense it is. But when you actually look at quantum theory, the vacuum means something even more dense, more incredible. Uh, so I was at that chemistry class, and that teacher told us that the atom was made out of 99.99% space. And, and that's when I started to examine the concept of the vacuum. And I started to think, and during my seminar, I'll show you know, scaling law that shows that the vacuum actually divides itself. But I started to think, maybe what we call reality is just divisions of the vacuum. Right, that the, actually the only thing there is is the vacuum, and when it divides, then we see it, <laughs> right? Like when, when there's a division, when there's a boundary, when there is an event horizon, right? Then we see the result, and we see the result because there's energy in the vacuum, and when, and when a boundary is gen generated, there's kind of a dislocation of the vacuum, uh, and when that happens, the electromagnetic fields are radiated. And so that becomes apparent to us because now there's radiation, right? And we call it an atom, we call it a, a, a sun, we call it a galaxy, whatever. So I started to think in those terms, scaling space-time, scaling structures of vacuum division. And I started to study, and again, in that big book, Gravitation, I found something very significant. 
Uh, I had figured this out before, but it's a good quote from that book. Although that book is not a quantum physics book, it mentions this in the middle of it. Present day quantum theory field, uh, quantum field theory gets rid by a renormalization process of an energy density in the vacuum that would formerly be infinite if not removed by renormalization. Okay. <laughs> that is a, that is a, quite the statement, isn't it? Now, what is renormalization? Renormalization is what they tried to do to me at school. <laughs> not quite. They didn't get, they didn't succeed, as you can tell. Uh, the uh, renormalization is, is, a, is a typical uh, trick that's used in physics uh, to get rid of infinities. Okay, in physics, there's two types of infinities. There's one type of infinity that's a quantity that's infinitely small. So they point zero 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 zero. Yeah, you 